You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with none other than Jake Evans. Uh, if you don't know who he is, then you're kind of uh, living under a rock in terms of, like, knowing your stuff. Because, like, in terms of metal, he's kind of an OG in his own time. And Enterfist was a huge, huge influence on the scene in Nova Scotia. So do your homework. Check out Enterfist and learn about this band because they're very important, I think, in the story. And if things had happened so many different ways that they could have happened at the time, who knows what happened, what could have happened with Enterfist. But either way, things are the way they are now. I'm lucky enough to live in Penticton and get to meet Jake. I'm lucky enough to call him my friend. I'm here at his house in front of his drum kit and all of his stuff in like the craziest jam room ever. So I just feel really fortunate to be sitting here right now and talking to you. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for talking to me and welcome to the pit, I should say. Cool, man. Pleasure to be on. I'm uh, happy to have you back. I mean, this is the third time you've been on the show, and yeah. I feel like I've still never really given you a proper interview. We're always gabbing about tunes and yeah. having a great time. And I was really, I want to thank you for coming in and doing the Sean Reiner episode, or Reiner, I always yeah. say stuff around. Well, but, uh, that's, that's important, big influence on a lot of us. And I, I just, that was the first time in my show where I was dealing with such a heavy topic, and I just wanted to get through it and, like, do it properly, and I think... You helped me kind of guide me through that. <laughs> yeah, well, we could go on for hours and hours about that, but it was really good to touch on it at that time because that individual deserves s such a ton of respect and yeah. admiration. And I tried to take time in that show to talk a little bit about Antrophis, and we played a song uh, on that episode, but we didn't get time to really dig into it because this is a huge topic, obviously. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like I was just saying at the beginning, Things could have happened so many different ways back in the 90s. It was a really confusing time for it was, metal, right? It was pretty wild. It was all over the place and that, uh, well, especially where I was from. But yeah, in the, the world as a whole, in the early 90s, it was just there was so much r things rapidly happening, and different genres and all kinds of, you know, record label chaos. And it was a real eye opener for like a young band at the time. And yeah, I mean... If we had started a couple of years earlier, it would have made a difference, or even later would have made a difference. It was such a kind of crazy window there. It would have been confusing not only for the musicians, but also for all the labels, obviously, right? Because they're oh, trying yeah. to figure out how do I market these guys, right? Yeah. And then they're just trying to copy what they've seen other people be successful with. So as soon as dollar. they see you, they just want to change you into something that they know works, and <laughs> then you don't you lose your identity right away. Sure lots of did. people tried to do that, and lots of people gave those A and R people the middle finger. Uh, <laughs> I wonder who. I, I won't. <laughs> but let's go back a little bit, okay? Sure. Uh, let's young Jake Evans. I I know uh, obviously um, a huge part of your upbringing was the tragedy of your mother passing at a young age, and that kind of yeah, spurred you maybe to get into heavier music and stuff. But go, let's go back a little bit earlier. Like, what do you remember about music before getting into the heavy stuff? Uh well, I always loved music, like most, you know, musicians that where it lasts through your life. Um, yeah, I mean, geez, I remember just Elton John and, and this, you know, and the radio and driving around with my mom and her neon green VW <laughs> rabbit and just tunes going all the time. And whereas my mom and, and dad met in a band in her No way. Yeah. Yeah. That's on the result of them meeting in a band. My dad was a big keyboard guy. Okay. And uh, my mom was a drummer, a renowned drummer in Halifax in the, in the sixties and early seventies. So they played together in a band? They played together in a band. What were they called? I have no idea. <laughs> I have a couple of old recordings of my mom, which is like uh, just gold to me. Um, yeah, just uh, all, all the old, I like Wilson Pickett and all kinds of cool stuff. Okay, like so that. they would do like kind of covers? Yeah, so they, yeah, they would do covers. Um, that was quite a thing, you know, touring yeah. all the legions and stuff like that. Well, you could make of, money doing it back yeah, then. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So... I don't know. Music was always there. Music was always in the house. But the strange thing about it is neither of my parents taught me music. So <laughs> they kind of sort of kept it from me. It was there. It was dangled in front of my face. But it wasn't celebrated like, we're going to pass it on to you, son. So it was, it was really disheartening for me as a kid. So, I mean, I would come home from school and I would sit at my dad's piano. Like, Dad, can you show me a couple little things? And he's like, get away from that thing. And so it was, it was really painful. And then, yeah, like my mom passed early, and which was, uh, yeah, exactly a tragedy. Way too young to die. And, yeah. And I remember her having me 
on her lap when I was, you know, just like four or five with sticks in my hands, like just doing like little fills and stuff, but not really where you would retain anything, just remembering it as it was a, a fun memory. But she passed and, and uh, yeah, I was probably around 12 and I don't know, I listened to every, every type of music. My mom was a massive Beatles fan, but I always didn't like the Beatles, <laughs> it, which is so strange because, you know, a lot of musicians really swear by the Beatles as yeah. far as, you know, where they started to experiment musically and stuff like that. And, I, and later on in life, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. I'm still yeah. not really a fan of the Beatles. <laughs> the Beatles <laughs> you know, Stones way over the Beatles for sure. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't until about 15 years old where I, I kind of dug my mom's drums mm -hmm. out, out of the basement, all dusty in the cases and yeah. set them up and... And my dad was not supportive at all. He's like, don't play those things when I'm home. So I don't, I don't know if that was a painful memory or he was just carrying on the, didn't want to pass on the music stuff. So, yeah. So, I mean, I got nowhere by myself. I was kind of terrible on those things. I had no guidance. And there was a, like a kind of an older kid in my neighborhood named Mike. And he was playing drums. And I learned just, well, just to be so inspired by him. He was super tight, had all his stuff down as uh his metal would come out, he would learn it, and I would just stare at him, like, how is that even possible? How are you even doing that from ear, from by ear? It's just crazy. What I mean, what led up to that is there was a, a local college radio in Halifax called CKDU. And I was, you know, was, after my mom passed, I was getting into kind of meaner stuff, like Motorhead and Priest and some Venom, and I was getting angry. And then there was that one day, they must have had like a hardcore punk show that led into a metal show, and or vice versa, but... It was either Black Flag, uh, the song Black Coffee, and the show transferred, and, and it was like Slayer, Black Magic, or something like that. So those okay. two song or two bands, at least, just completely changed like my world. So uh, I must have been, yeah, just turning 13 and just going off the deep end, looking for crazier, faster, heavier stuff. And yeah. that, that, that's what really made me pull those drums out of the basement and start bashing away on those things. But yeah, I mean, I did that. And, for a long time and I took some lessons and just wasn't really getting it. I was kind of scatterbrained really. I was really into like skateboards and BMX and, and, and playing music, but, but not really taking it seriously where, okay, I need to, to buckle down and get a band together. And it didn't really happen until people started leaving uh, guitars at my house. <laughs> so then I started noodling on that and that I could pl practice late into the night because I couldn't play my drums with my dad around. So when I was like 18 and 19, I actually, I guess I got fairly good at, at guitar, but I always approached it like it was a, kind of like an art canvas with weird notes and intervals and strange squeals and blips and lots of chromatics. And I would punch on it basically like it was the drum. So maybe I probably should have been a bass player in, <laughs> in hindsight. I don't know. But yeah, and then just started from there. I got crazy. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> so uh, people are leaving guitars and stuff at your house because like it was kind of like a jam vibe going yeah. on. Yeah, well, everyone school. usually jams at the drummer's house, right? Because right. you know you kind of jam where like the biggest instrument is, and, and yeah, like my friends in high school, they, they're all super into you know all traditional stuff, ACDC and, and early Metallica, and that was really fun for me to to try to learn on right. on drums and stuff. But honestly, my timing was terrible, and I didn't really get it. And uh, I don't know the lessons. They weren't really helping. The lessons at a music conservatory are usually geared to to string you along as long as possible and, and, and get your money. Not that not that the instructors were terrible people, but it, that's a business, right? So that that was kind of like my first uh, glimpse into how music can be, you know, less about the art and more about money. So that that was a good lesson because that that transformed so many aspects of life. Like later on when I actually got into dance stuff and just instruction in general and working at studios and for, for other people. And so it was a great life lesson, just, uh, you know, kind of a harsh one, but it's good to have your eyes open. I think a lot of metal people eventually adopt a lot of the do it yourself attitude. Well, that really, that really comes from punk too, right? Before, before metal. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. Guys, yeah. So, I mean, most of the metal that I like, not all of it, but really does, come from that punk sensibility that that whole thing like i mean look at those scenes like in new york and in la and well in uk and stuff for sure that was basically done with like broken equipment and like a 
Sharpie and some old paper, <laughs> like, for poet, like it really was, like, as bare bones as you could get, you know, right down to the, the song structure. So, yeah. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't like to talk about, too, is the overlap, right? It's just like, I've always heard so many stories about, oh, yeah, we would go to the party and we'd see a punk guy show up and we'd kick him and, you know, throw him down the stairs and, like, mm. drag him out of the house by his, well, you, oh, I mean, that would be a metal guy being dragged by his hair because the yeah. punk guys were supposed to be bald, blah, 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 all this animosity. But there was obviously a huge overlap and a lot of people that yeah. didn't care and a lot of bands that kind of mm. define the mold of, like, the punk people like it, the metal guys like it, everybody can like it kind of a thing. Yeah, well, the, the biggest bands for that, for us, and I and I think in a lot of scenes, but, I mean, when I was younger, I didn't even really consider, like, the other scenes. You're just too busy living in your own moment, your own time. You're, you know, we're obviously aware of punk rock and New York hardcore and, and UK and, you know, the West Coast sound and all that stuff, but we're not, like... For me, myself, I wasn't, well, I need to emulate what's going on in those scenes. But no, I was just in my own little world. And for me, I guess, like I truly was and still am, a punk rock dude playing as much metal sounding stuff as I can. I'm just, I, you know, I'm not, there's other people out there that share the, the same thing. But I mean, I look at myself and I really am. Like I just, I'm just kind of a weirdo artist guy. You know, I just really against the grain and a lot of things and, and not just music but just a way of thinking and, and life and uh yeah like i mean I, I love technical crazy metal sounding things but it's it's always through that kind of punk lens like i'm just you know i hear the bands today and I just my my jaw drops and i love it and i listen to it but i'm just i i will never be that technically i don't know good of a player and I kind of want want to be, but then at the same time, I listen to the tune, and then I, I hear like the rawness and the blips, and the, and I, I kind of like it. That's kind of part of my sound. I like it, and it, I'm hoping it kind of separates because mm -hmm. I'm playing, you know, semi technical stuff. But the thing is, if I go to a, a show where three, three really polished bands are playing, that in itself to me becomes a form of monotony. Yeah. Like, it's so good, it's so good, it's so good, and then I'm kind of falling asleep. Well, you know, I yeah. want to hear somebody f flub their pick, yeah. or like a little chirp or a squeal. To me, that's like character. It's like, uh, you know, some people build uh, show cars, and some people build like rat rods, you know what yeah. I mean? I'm kind of like somewhere in the middle. I like something nice, but I like it with a, a dent and a scratch. I just... <laughs> like yeah it's mean it's badass it <laughs> tells a story it's yeah. just all about that well it i don't know it's, i've been thinking about it lately too is there's just so much gatekeeping in mm. the genre and, and sp specific genres in metal too like there's just people who are just elitist like if you're not into if you don't do xyz then you don't fit and like yeah. they just kind of push things out that they think is not the core of yeah, whatever I've, this I thing think, is. I think I was like that for like a couple of years in my early 20s, but it was stupid. I didn't yeah. know any better. I was just so, so ignorant and sheltered. I mean, our scene in Halifax was so crazy at that time. Like when we started it, it seemed, okay, well, we're metal and we're in the metal scene. And then it was like a year later, boom, we had all these like awesome like hip hop groups and all this, you know, terrible grungy stuff you know some good people and some decent musicians but you know when you're purposely trying to play kind of bad to to nab a record deal and all i'm just i'm just not into that like you know it's all about it sounds cliche and stupid but being real and <laughs> being like who you are that's, i've always done that with music and the way I react to things in life and it's it's crummy because you know you you lose friends sometimes by polarizing issues and yourself and but I just can't help it I need to know at the end of the day I didn't I wasn't fake about it yeah. so you know but music yeah. especially so let's get into the beginning of Entropis so like yeah. meeting all these guys uh Sean yeah what a monster on the drums that was, yeah. that was so funny that story because, yeah, I finally uh, figured, yeah, I'm going to play guitar in a band. And I had uh, met some younger guys that went to the high school I had just graduated from. 
and they had a talent show and they're like like some skate dudes i knew and some little young musicians and in the neighborhood so i'm like well i've got a few songs i'll teach you guys how to play them so yeah it was uh nick shane and scott and basically i'm like a like a conductor okay you play this and i'll play this and you do this beat do 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 and i put it all together and we entered their talent show which my old high school which i had a lot of problems with so it was kind of like a revenge uh, <laughs> battle of the band saying so funny we were called phobia had badass logo and and it was really funny. We played the songs, and we won this talent show. And all the Bon Jovi cover band, uh, like total hair metal kids, were like just livid. But then I was like, "This is really cool." It was like kind of a, like a ego boost, and we put it together. So just by fluke, I'm walking around in, in Bedford, Nova Scotia. I'm skating with some friends, and I see this this total typical in the box metal looking guy. Uh, walking through the McDonald's parking lot with a Sacrifice t-shirt. Sacrifice is like one of our favorite yeah. Canadian thrash bands of all time. Yeah. So I just, I just run right, dude, oh man, we got that show, I was at the show, and I said, I I got to sit behind Goss and the kit, and he's like, oh yeah, well I play drums, and you know, kind of a big deal. Because <laughs> he thought he was, it's so funny. So I'm like, yeah, I, just, I got a kind of a band going, he's, and he was, he didn't have to, but he was just being nice. He's like, well, why don't you come to my rehearsal space and we'll throw around some riffs. And I just thought it was really cool, like this kind of actual metal dude. And I've got like a, you know, full crazy, I basically look like uh, Blackie from Voivod, like just, you know, crazy mohawk, scrawny skater dude. So I thought that was kind of cool. Anyway, I just went up there by myself one day, we jammed, and it was instant, like, click. He just had all these sick beats to all my kind of weird riffs. And then I brought Scott, the bass player from that little school phobia band, and boom, we had we, we ended up playing all those songs, but gave them all a kick in the ass. Wrote a couple of more, and then and I had a song called "Buried in Carnage." It was really funny, and uh, Sean wanted to call the band that. And I said, "No way, man! Um, my friend has been wanting to use uh, the name Entrophis for his band, but after hearing us together, I, I have to steal it." I stole the name from my <laughs> my friend. I don't know if it ended the ended the friendship or not, but Entrophis was so suiting to that suited for that music, and nobody ever nobody ever said no. There was no fighter because it was just it was just had to be done. And then uh, yeah, so we were arguing about the band name, and then I drew that famous Entrophis logo, and and then Sean was like, oh my god, that yeah. That's it. So yeah, I did all that by hand. This is all before computers and stuff. I, I, I'm a I'm an art college dropout. I kind of got accepted, went in there, got tired of seeing all these fake people wanting to tell me their monologue and wear long scarves and ride the old bikes, which I all like. But when you're trying to do that, it's just, just that whole fakery. So yeah, I drew up this wicked logo. We got six songs and we recorded our first demo. On a VCR of all things, my, my buddy Andy uh, Swingler, super cool guy. We, we I think we yeah we recorded everything live like off the floor except the vocals. On to, I guess the VCR has two tracks. I, I'm not sure. So we must have put it into a mixer and put it on one track. And then the other track I did the vocals in his living room while his family was having a dinner in the dining room with a blanket over my head, trying to. And this is I didn't I didn't really have a good singing voice. I used to kind of do like a creator like, like sort of thing but then i was like no uh, death metal's where it's at i love the ultra low growl i think that's the coolest thing so it's me just basically talking like cookie monster under black and like and it's just terrible absolute freaking terrible music's like really really good kind of a you know bad recording but we need because people were bugging us like crazy we had we had a to play a few shows and people were coming by the rehearsal spot yeah. all the bands in there and the other rehearsal spot would stop and come and be crowding, mostly because of Sean's double bass work, right? And plus, I'm a freak. I've got, like, braids and dreads, and I wear my guitar super high under my chin like a violin. And Scott was, like, 15. He was, like, literally like a kid. Like a kid. And it's just, like, just a weird-looking band. You basically have, like, a total, you know, trained metal drummer keeping it all together, which allowed me to just write the most stupid weird crazy riff ever so everyone else is you know chugging along doo -doo -doo -doo, and i love all of that stuff but i'm like i looked at it i'm like how do i play this backwards upside down and 
times seven divided by all this is cyber. So that was just me. That's how I looked at everything, art and BMX tricks and stuff. I'm just like, how can you just twist this, invert it into this weirdness? And he allowed us to do that, however difficult it was to play with that individual. But Scott, that guy was unbelievable. He could go faster with two fingers on the bass than I could, I could pick. Like to this day, the guys, those guys were incredible musicians. I'm I'm like a fluke musician, and it was really really fun. It was super fun. We would do gigs on our own, and you know get to open for some uh, decent bands. Yeah, and that was uh, yeah the first entry show was opening for Sacrifice when they came back, and and it was uh, that was a total fluke. A friend of mine was the promoter, Warren Wesson for all the big shows in Halifax. And I don't know, he needed somebody for an opening slot. He came down to the rehearsal spot because he wasn't just going to let us go up there. Um, I mean, he knew us all from just being fans and going to gigs, but he hadn't, he hadn't heard anything like that. And I just remember he sat there kind of dumbfounded, you know, like what we were playing. He's like, well, it's pretty tight and it's pretty heavy and you got the gig. I'm just like, there's no way I'm opening for Soccer Race for like my first gig with this band like that's crazy i i had basically played that high school like yeah. less than a year before yeah and i played a couple of gigs uh on drums like at the school and one outdoor thing that was all terrible all, all my gig experience I, I had three gigs under my belt and one was positive like <laughs> at the high school and it was still not really that great it's just that that we were original and we wrote our own tunes and we actually put some time into creating something but no, this this was on, and I remember I almost had like a stage fright, heart attack, like opening for Sacrifice, because I don't know. But it was it was pretty wicked, because I mean, Sean had those uh, clear Ludwig drums, those clear like they're I don't know what they're some kind of plasticky Zytel, I don't know what it was. So he had clear drums. Scott he, used, he had super long hair and like wore like really short shorts, which I thought was just absolutely hilarious. Even though it was like the early 90s, it was kind of funny. And then I'm just like, I was uh, kind of sponsored by my local skateboard shop at the time. And they had this clothing company called Shreds. So they had, yeah, this is, and it's funny because it was almost like a fuzzed out logo that you'd see in a, like a black metal band now. <laughs> so the long sleeve black shirt had these like logos down the side and it kind of looked like a, like a death metal band, but it was a skateboard company. It was really cool. So I have this black BC Rich Ironbird like tucked under my chin with all black and like super long braids and dreads. And I'm just like, this band must have just looked so weird. And I'm 19. I'm just like, like I'm skinny as, not like today, <laughs> but just super skinny weirdo guy like singing and these crazy riffs. And Sean's just like double kick, like overplaying everything. But it works. Like now I'm just like, ah, it's just quit it. But now it was just nuts. So you'd have half the people watching him, people looking at me shaking the head like, how was he playing a guitar so high? <laughs> and like these riffs that are just so fast and chromatic and ridiculous. And then Scott, there's like this literal kind of high school kid, like short shorts. And it just was so funny and bizarre. So we kind of got a little bit of a following just on the spectacle of it. Right. But then people started really paying attention to the music and yelling out song titles and singing like choruses and stuff. And, <laughs> and I'm just like, this is so bizarre to me. Cause it's <laughs> like, there's a part of me that wants to kind of destroy things. And I, not like that, almost like, okay, this is what metal is supposedly is. I'm going to add a, a Jake touch to it and try to alienate people on purpose. Like by contrarian, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I guess yeah. I am. I guess I am like that. I, I make fun of contrarians, but I guess I, guess I am one. Um, yeah, it was just like just sick sounding harmonies and just a silence surrounding a purposely bad note for the effect of the that sound, that abrasive, you know. And I still carry that with me today. Yeah. Maybe not so much because. Um, uh, we're not as adventurous like with my stuff today, mostly because those two those two musicians allow me to to do whatever I want. It's not that I want, I don't want to do that and move into that, but you know, hopefully, eventually, I can I can evolve back into a, my comfortable <laughs> my weird spots. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, but that's... What else would you like to know about the early days? Uh, Shag. Oh, yeah, I'm pronouncing his name yeah, right. Yeah, uh, Shigeki Itome. Now that guy... So, oh, so Scott, they're a young bass player. Yeah. Sean basically made me kick him out of the band. Because oh. It, well, Scott was really young, but he, yeah. we were all really immature. And it must have been kind of bizarre to, it, like, have that kind of it was difference Char, with the hang by. Sean's a, a great, you know, fantastic gigs. musician, but, you know, a very, you know, you have to know your geography of uh, Nova Scotia. If you're from Nova Scotia, and I say, well, he's a, he's a Bedford boy people would know it's kind of a almost like a conservative kind of that elitist it's a, like a preppy stuck up kind of air about the place right so that was you know kind of weird he was from like gray homes i think his dad was a professor and stuff like that so you know never really faced any challenges you know no no traumas you know in the a billion traumas already <laughs> before you're out of your teens you know, it's, I'm Scott's mom's a single mom, like raising him and stuff like that. But, you know, Scott at the time would joke around, and I think he was just like nervous trying to fit in with the older guys, but Sean didn't like it. And he's like, Scott's too immature. We'll have to find a more mature bass player. And me being so excited, being in a, like, like a potentially wicked band, yeah. I went along with it. And we're like, sorry, dude, we're going to look for somebody. And it's like a huge regret because he was a wicked musician. Uh, great guy. I'm still friends with him to this day. I, I often talk to him like, man, we should just redo another project like like kind of online, like with files and stuff. And he's, he was always totally game. So I kind of don't know what happened to him. And then we got, I can't remember because we had another guy, another skater friend of mine, Serge, who came in. But I can't remember if we had Shag and then Serge and then... Shag again, I can't remember, but uh, Shigeki, crazy Japanese guy, like just not. I lived with him for a while. Okay, like the guy is insane. He's <laughs> he's a samurai. He's a, he's a, from samurai descent. This guy would walk up behind me and put his finger on my top lip and ask me, tr say, try to move, and I was paralyzed. Like the guy knew all these pressure points, which is actually really good because anytime I had a headache, he would poke his fingers into my skull and make my like my headaches disappear. This guy was like, you know. He, like a like a Mr. Miyagi, like a karate kid. Knew the yeah. chi. Yeah, dude, it was insane. <laughs> this guy from Western Diet of like Donairs and Pepsi was like extre like overweight for what he should have been. I seen this guy lay on his back, cross his hands and his arms over his chest, and just kip up to his feet in like a kung fu fighting stance. And I'm like, dude, you're like a hundred pounds overweight. How are you doing this? Like muscle memory and technique. It was ridiculous. That's so I was like, terrified of this guy. <laughs> and as far as bass, like all he would ever talk about was uh, Victor Wooden, right? Yeah. And it, it was dumb. Like, <laughs> I'm just like, it's funny. I'm writing all these songs and I'm writing all this bizarre stuff. And I'm the weakest musician in this band. Like, Sean, incredible drum. Uh, Shigeki, like, that guy, that guy could have went on to instruct it. But I don't know whatever, IT, Bert, I don't know, it's just, guys dumb, They're, those guys are ridiculous musicians, so then it just got foolish, so then I'm just like, all right, I'm just gonna write these crazy songs, and, and, yeah, we did have a, uh, another guitar player, and, uh, he contributed as well, too, but as far as, you know, like, Entropist, the, the vision of that band, and the concept of writing a specific, you know, type of, heavy and odd thing yeah. I you know I guess that was mostly me it was yeah my thing so